Awesome. Thanks, Gabe. All right, Plan Sage Weekly, July 6, 2022. And John, you have the first point. I do indeed. So next week, 12th of July, we'll welcome Stanislav to plan product planning as a back-end engineer. You're encouraged, I would say, to reach out to him, welcome him in advance. I've shared his LinkedIn. Since we'll be publishing this video, I will not share his uh, surname or LinkedIn on the video. Um, I can say that it is not Sophie Ellis Baxter and Giant Capitals, which is what I originally pasted into the agenda. I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, if you saw that, um, that was an Easter egg. Um, so yeah, please reach out to Stanislav and you know welcome him and tell him how much we're looking forward to having him on the team uh on the same day next week because monday is in fact family and friends day uh we'll welcome nicholas dular as well a senior back and engineer and you're of course welcome to reach out to nicholas on slack and organize a coffee chat etc to welcome him i think it's public knowledge now that he'll be joining the team and that's great um yeah that's it any questions comments if not i will hand over to gabe going once going twice okay Gabe uh I feel like I have too many things on the agenda so if somebody wants to add other things go for it uh I was just curious to get a quick uh pulse check of where we're at with work items and thinking about what we uh feel like we should prioritize for 15.3 in terms of the that whole sort of work stream so love some input from y'all As far as work items, I was going to write a follow-up question uh, more so than an answer to yours in that uh, to get it to um, or to turn it on for all of GitLab.com again, we have an epic, uh, which I'll link to in here. But I think in order to get to that point where we're turning it on for GitLab.com, all we need is more context. So breadcrumbs or parent hierarchy. Is that, is that accurate? And then if so, um, I'm not too sure where we're at with that. And if we're on track for 15.3 or not, or not 15.3, 15.2 or not. Yes, I think it's the more context is the most important thing. Um, so I'll follow up with, I was looking at that issue the other day. I can go track down. I'm just more curious. I know we have assignees that are sort of in progress. We have a weight widget that's in progress. We have the labels widget that's in progress. Um, like after those, what, what do we want to focus on? Do we want to focus on like milestones and iterations or do we want to focus on discussions and system notes and that sort of thing? So we can start trying to get parity with um, epics. Because I also know that uh, Alexander has started the work to move issues to project namespace. And I have an open issue that I need to go see with some questions about migrating epics to issues and or my, migrating epics to work items and that whole transition plan. But I'm just curious what we want to focus on next in terms of building out work items. If there's like a general thought where y'all feel strongly like we should do discussions next or system notes and events and that sort of thing, or if we should keep working on kind of other widgets. So for requirements, um, the two things that come to mind are system notes, because we do have those ha, requirements around tracking uh, execution and change of basically the verified status. At least in my mind, that would be system notes. Um, and then I know discussions are also a huge uh, ask for requirements um, as far as like rounding out that experience. I think for epics, right? If I think of the epics transition, that work is more like in the product planning uh, arena in that I think we need to build out the depth of the hierarchy past one level, right? Once we get this initial um, like version out. But I think for your team, 
gave discussions and system notes, I, I think advanced requirements more and like build a path for issues to be migrated. Okay, cool. Then uh, how do we feel about spinning up a spike for that? And why don't, we won't obviously get all of it done <laughs> in one milestone because I think it's a lot, but at least starting the architecture plan for that because I know we want to start using subscriptions instead of the real-time changes endpoint for some of that stuff and some other things. So I will schedule that out and maybe we can get started on it in 15.3 uh, while we clean up some of the stuff that's already in progress. A little note on this. We won't be able to reuse the existing components and applications for discussions from issue and merge request. They're very tightly bound to Vuex. It was the case with design management too. We needed to build our own and a design management discussion, design management node components. Hopefully we could reuse these if we modify them, but keep in mind that we should probably assume that we will need to build this from scratch. So this okay. will be even bigger task. Do you think that when we do, sorry, go ahead, Donald. No, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say, do you think we should go ahead and <clears throat> do some of the design work or I guess UX research or whatever we wanna do around uh resolvability because i know that exists in the design notes it's already in the issues api uh, or in the notes api for things to be resolvable and that's like the big ask too that we've gotten lots of feedback on for notes within issues um do we want to explore that or is that something that would be fairly easy to add on later after we sort of if, if we build it from scratch to add on that experience on top of basically parity with existing issue notes we can delay it a bit. Um, it's fairly easy to add on top of that because for design management, again, it wasn't implemented initially and we added it in the end of the process working on discussions. So we need to make a research, but don't make it priority one. Okay, sounds good. What about, um, so another request that has come up is how to see what's new. Um, and I think there's been maybe some exploration of this in the past. Uh, I, I would say that's, should be a fairly high like if we're going to rebuild something like we should we should try to do that um is that sort of the same in terms of implementation or is that does that require a little bit more like upfront to make sure that it's built in a way that we could actually somehow show like you've seen this before or you haven't seen this before Yes, I think we should think through that. I also think we should rethink our deep linking strategy, um, or at least think through how we want to handle deep linking notes. Um, right now, I think one of the biggest uh, performance or front end, at least uh, performance or perception, perceptive perception performance aspects are around perceived perceived there you go <laughs> thank you um is around uh deep linking a note that has a lot of discussions uh within it so yeah if we can rethink through that now i think now's the opportune time to do that yeah because we don't have pagination well, right on notes yeah, okay, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry, I think that was you. I was gonna say, if we're uh, talking <laughs> about uh, new features that we want, <laughs> another one that comes up often, especially when we're thinking about um, OKRs and epics that are used by like projects, is the concept of like a note that is a check in, right? Like a status update blurb. I don't know if that fits in cleanly with discussions or if it's something else, but it's this kind of different type of comment that you leave uh, that's meant to be a summary of what's happening with that item. Uh, a little bit different than a comment, but it's still kind of like a tech thing that you leave. Maybe that's a completely separate feature. Maybe it's the same thing. I don't know if you've given that some thought, Gabe, or not. Yeah, this is very similar to what Respond has built or is building for the timeline widget, where you can either if you go to the timeline tab, you can add a new event to the timeline tab, which is the same thing as a check-in, or you can add a comment and then you can click a button on any existing comment to add it to the timeline with, I think, the timestamp of that comment as well, which is 
the same thing as a check-in in in my in my mind because it will show you everything it's it's almost like a a fancier system note that gets consolidated in this one little view up in the top so i i think we should see if we can try to use that and make it more generic um there's also open issues for things like pinning comments to the top and all that stuff and i think these are great things to explore uh during the spike so that way we can do proper ux kind of exploration even if we're not going to build some of the stuff for a while and then we can do proper uh, engineering um kind of refinement on how we want to tackle this stuff so yeah and just to explain for those of, the, of you that may not have seen ally basically you have the option to on any okr write a status update um and say like we're each person that owns that OKR every month has to go check in on the item and just write a quick sentence or two about what's going on with it. Uh, and you write that in, right? And you click check in and sort of like a comment, except that is shown in various reports along the way and ally as this is the latest status from the person that is working on this item. So it's not the description, right? It's something that's expected to change every month or so, but it's a quick summary and that's bubbled up in various views and if somebody wants to quickly go in and look at a specific item and know what's happening with it they know to look at that specific for those specific check-in things all right Donald I think you're next uh, yeah, so making sure my question makes sense, but I think it does because you answered. Um, but <laughs> so yeah, discussions seem like uh, there's still a few questions or changes we want to make to um, the way they're shown um, or from the way they're shown in legacy issues. Uh, system notes seem a little bit more uh, known around how we want to display those. Because uh, I think that'll be a little bit more similar to legacy issues. Uh, what do y'all think of 15.3 focusing on um, the UX side of things for discussions and doing more of a technical spike on any any questions we have on the technicals on the engineering side of things or system notes? I just said yes. And if we can get system notes for existing widgets using GraphQL subscriptions and like uh, however we want to build the front end and think through just like the API for that, I think it's great. Uh, I know there was some open discussions about if we want to like nest events with widget within widgets or if we want to have like a separate events attribute in the GraphQL API. So that's all good stuff to just like hash out. And um, I think that'll be fine. Is there separate polling currently for discussions and notes? Or do we, we load the original, we load the discussion first and then we poll for notes constantly, I think. Yes. And it could be yes. either are they discussion notes and system notes that we poll for. I think we do poll for both. It's still a benefit, like if we can get that, you know, the system notes into a WebSocket instead, like updating over WebSocket instead. It would just be nice to get rid of that notes polling entirely. Same with the real time changes. I agree. Uh, I think on the yeah. next one, this, sorry, go ahead, Donald. If you want no, to go ahead. OK, it's, it's not a huge discussion. I was just sharing this because I know a couple weeks ago we were talking about how to surface permissions to the front end so that you know what you can do, all that kind of good stuff. I just double across Google Docs APIs and they have an interesting like capabilities object that lists all the things that the, the user can do based on their current permissions. Uh, so I just sharing that if you wanted some inspiration from what a competitor has done. Um, it's pretty good uh we don't have to really discuss that so it's real uh and the next one on five i got some rough feedback from a customer last week and it wasn't about plans specifically that it was more general like um uh a, a feeling that gitlab has over time continued to 
decline in our ability to uh, interact successfully and respond to requests from the water community, specifically noting how our backlog is like out of control <laughs> across the entire product. Um, and it sort of is like there's thousands of issues and lots of them are super old. Uh, when I come across them that are super old, some of them are still good. We just can't do it yet. Um, but there's also a slew of issues that never get looked at or touched. And I think this has made certain people like just stop interacting with us entirely, which is a not good thing. Because <laughs> if people no longer want to open issues and report things or provide feedback, it sort of uh, it, it will hurt us in the long run. And I think uh supporting the wider community is like one of the most important things that we should keep top of mind and so i'm curious if there's any uh ideas around some sort of process we can do like once a quarter or something where everyone on the team sort of helps out uh clearing out duplicates or won't do or like no op bugs or things that have already been resolved just so that we can start to like cut down on the number of issues that we have within the plan stage. I think right now, last time I checked, it's somewhere in the five to 6,000 range. Um, and I, I would suspect that a large percentage of those are all things that are duplicates, uh, things that we, just, we won't do or things that are no longer relevant because uh, we fix them. So does so anyone have suggestions on this or open to exploring doing this as a team? I've got I've got one tangential suggestion, which is that um, community folks raising issues, customers, and so on, can't put labels on the issues. And it's not at all unprecedented for me to find a you know have a bug reported in a ticket, and find an issue for it. Nobody knows about it because it's not been labeled for anybody's stage. And that might be weeks or months. Could be a lot longer. And I, I, I think it's an access thing. It might be possible for people to label issues literally when they press the create button, but after that, they can't do it. Yeah, we do that for, it's an intentional decision. We've gone back and forth on this with some, some folks, some customers who want to be able to do that or, but, but more or less like when you let uh, somebody who is not a project member, um, update metadata on issues then it gets really messy because they do things that they shouldn't do and it messes up workflows so there's like complaints on both sides um but i get what you're saying i also know that i believe there's a triage policy that and where quality engineering looks at all the issues with no team label on them and assigns one or takes a best guess but i'm not sure if that's still working or not Yeah, I like the idea generally. Um, and as I said here, like it worked for security issues, but we had like maybe an order of magnitude fewer. Um, we did a triage exercise just as back end EMs and we kind of grouped them together um, under like similar root causes, um, closed out duplicates, closed out old ones or things we just weren't going to fix. And we got the thing down pretty well in the end to a small number of security issues. Um, but like, I don't know if it's as easy to do that for bugs, because I think on the, like, certainly on the product planning side, I think there are 90 or hundred bugs, project management, like 540 open bugs, um, something like that. And like, when I was trying to figure out like what percentage would be closed by the work items work, there was no way I was going to look through all those. So I just took a sample of 10%, um, and yeah even then like it's quite a lot like if you did this cross functional prioritization thing where like i tried to reorder just in order of priority our tech debt issues and it was you can hold about 10 in your head and then after that like it's very hard to kind of sort things in any kind of order or keep any context in your head so um yeah i don't know how to approach it is basically what i'm saying but i suppose if we could like you know, do one tenth every month, like or something. Maybe that would be the way to do it. So I don't. Even then, it feels like a pretty incredible exercise, though. But I totally get what you're saying. Like, certainly, like looking through a lot of the issues, a lot of them like seem like they could be duplicates, or will just be closed, or could be closed in the process of doing work items. 
Yeah, I think I think that's the big one is the ones that will be closed short term by the move over to work items. Um, I went through, uh, we did uh, as part of the prior prioritization um, work or the next prioritization work. Uh, I looked through the maintenance issues for project management. There was about, I think it was like a little bit over a hundred. Um, and I think that at least, I don't know, 70% maybe um, were either stuff that we could close or stuff that's going to be taken care of as part of feature work. Um, and then I was looking through other uh, their uh, issues um, because I think we went through recently and reclassified our issues um, or moved them to either type bugs or type maintenance or type feature. Um, and just looking at project management, there are 1600, uh, yeah, over 1600 feature um, issues. I wonder if that's accurate. I feel like that's that like some of those have to be bugs. Um, and I don't know how we would go around go around handling those. Like, should we should we include those? Like if we go through and try to clear out the duplicate bugs, are we not going to get to all of them? Like, are we still gonna have this issue if we only look at type? bugs during that exercise? We want to do all of it. Yeah, yeah but I want to, I, I'm blanking right now, right? But I, I know for a fact that I've seen in the product planning backlog, like two feature requests from, from the community and they've literally asked for diametrically opposite things. Um, you know, one has been like, can we, can you build this on and the other one is like please can you stop building this on can you take these away and it's like so maybe you know we need to be like more kind of liberal with the close button <laughs> i don't know for a lot of features like maybe we just have the won't fix label and um to, yeah take a take an opinionated stance on some more things yeah i think we should do a backlog cleanup uh so thanks for bringing this up uh Gabe, I also, my brain immediately goes to like, oh, this probably is a problem for our customers too. Uh, I know it's been a problem for me in the past at other companies. It's not just a GitLab thing. Uh, sometimes caused by me. Sometimes I inherited just like a really old backlog. And I've had to go through this given a, a much smaller scale. Uh, but there are sort of like rules you can use. Um, that I have in the past. And I do wonder if we can build this into GitLab triage in the future, right? Like the things that I've done have been like anything older than X, I actually just like have closed <laughs> in the past. It's been like pretty generous, right? And again, it's different because it wasn't a public backlog, but I've done things where it's like anything older than a year, I just like have closed it. Uh, anything, uh, I also had moderated a, um, uh, forum feedback forum before that was public and anything that had less than x votes i closed right and just had like a it wasn't automated it was like me i had a blurb that i just left that i was like hey this is older than x and didn't receive enough traction so it's being closed and people are generally understanding of that uh surprisingly i didn't get that many complaints uh and then that that's the easy stuff from there it gets much harder <laughs> Uh, you have to like search by keywords and try to cluster. Finding duplicates is very difficult uh, for a human. So that's where I'm like, that's where the automation stuff would be helpful because that that's the hard part. Um, but we should definitely try and come up with systems. And once we do, we should write issues for that and try to get them codified so that a PM doesn't have to do that. Again, like I don't want to do this more than a couple of times. Yeah, and Donald, I think we were are experimenting with ML to do auto labeling uh, based on 
Uh, I'm not sure what we're looking at in terms of training algorithms there. I can ask uh, Tanuki Stan, and I think that's the Slack channel, maybe uh, how it works. But I think it's just for applying like group and stage and feature labels and stuff like that, not deciding whether or not something should be open or closed. I've also know, know that at one point we did uh, add something to triage that would automatically close old stale issues. And then that also offended the water community because like <laughs> these are still real things. They're still real like bugs that you haven't fixed yet. So don't do that. <laughs> um, I think once we do uh, go through and get everything cleaned up, it'll be easier to stay on top of. Like that's how I felt about my own to do's. Right, like, because once you you get it down to a page or two, then it's easy to, to see the new things and triage them quickly. Um, and then I also dropped a link to VS Code's closing guidelines. And so I think maybe for this, uh, what I'll do is I'll open up a discussion issue as the next step um, in the plan project issue and the plan project to nail down what we want to do async so we can kind of take this async i don't think we're going to come up with the perfect thing but um i'd like to continue the discussion if that's cool with everyone um next uh there's discussion going on in the retro about story splitting um and so i linked to some an article that i shared there as well and then when I was looking at uh, some of the issues that I had authored, like the assignees issue, um, I kind of just noticed that like the first eight or so acceptance criteria on the issue could have been split out into smaller discrete issues. Um, like we could use tasks for this in the future, or we could just like um, br break them out into issues and then they can be assigned to an epic like they are today. But I'm curious, like if this is a uh, would would have been helpful for engineering if there were like more discrete things, like for example, um, let me share my screen record. I'll just kind of show you what I was talking about. Like search for an assignee could be a separate issue. Uh, Auto paginate could be a separate issue. Being able to add an assignee could be a separate one. Removing one a separate one. So these all could be there's like ind independent small discrete steps of this bigger issue. And I'm curious if that would have been helpful to engineering if I had broken those down into issues ahead of time. Um, and if so, also what's like a good signal early on that we should break something down further, if that makes sense. Um, so I just like to have a quick discussion on this sync. That's cool. Absolutely, it makes sense. And I'm happy to see that you split it on stories the way I split the MRs on the front end. It's like basically few of them are repeating my MRs and the way I've split the issue when making merge requests. So yeah, it would be much easier also to track progress for both product and engineering managers. Because currently it's like just sleeping through the next milestone. It will be slipped in 15 to 2 because backend is not ready. There are a few things that we need. And it seems that we're doing nothing while we're doing steady progress. And splitting these stories would give you a nice picture. And it would also be more, I don't know, satisfiable for engineers because you can see, okay, like there is a progress made there. And also we could estimate it better in terms of weight because right now Asan is estimated as weight five and it makes no sense. The weight is much higher and it's super hard to estimate when the issue is that big. Okay, how do we define when do we need to split? I think early discussion with engineers would probably give you some picture on that because normally we are aware about if something is big enough or small enough for example weight it would be much harder to split on stories this way maybe like two to three stories only so i think the only way is just individual discussion on every single issue that we plan for the milestone well, okay uh, i agree that like splitting helps with the progress but I'm of the opinion actually that we need both, like this acceptance criteria, but also every every like checkbox here would point to an issue. Then using this issue itself as an as a entry point, if you will, seeing the summary. What what worked well for us in workspaces was making use a lot of the epics actually, and like that that face splitting, if you will, or MVCs or steps or something like that, and then. You can easily see, like I'm working on this feature, but these are the issues that I can uh, specifically work on or 
um, like we can we can split them in parallel. Like I I didn't find I don't find it very easy to use the related issues if if that makes sense, right? If you, like you have an issue with a lot of related stuff to it, a lot of the time those related issues don't actually mean subtasks or tasks of that specific issue, but there is a lot of noise um, in related issues. And, and for, for, for scope, for like breaking down scope, it feels like epics works much better in that sense that you can have sub issues or sub, sub epics, which really encapsulates the work that needs to be done for, for this specific item. Um, so yeah, I do feel that we need both, like at least within one place and then splitting down as to when to split the down. I'd, I'd really like the way that you have broken it down, I'd really pass it on to engineers, whoever is picking it up. They may do two tasks in one issue or every single task in, in a separate issue or MR, depending how that works out on the, on the technical side. But maybe in this sense, having something like, please split it down into specific issues or, or some note like that for the engineers. I don't know how to, to handle that message to let everyone know that, well, we do encourage you to create a specific issue for, for every task that you work on or a specific MR and link it here. It doesn't have to be, well, yeah, I don't know if it, for some engineers it feels as an overhead to have to create the issue and the corresponding MR, right? Because it basically does the same thing, but I don't think it's a big deal if we just use the issue as a placeholder, if you will, um, have the description of the issue um, be the same task and, and link to the MR or whatever, just to make it easier for the PMs and for who else works on, on the issue level to track, to track progress. That makes sense. Donald? Yeah. Gabe, okay, uh, I think the consensus, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Donna. You can jump in. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think the consensus is that like from retro and here, it's like you and I, Gabe, should be using epics to lay out like what the business problem is and then putting something like that of, of acceptance criteria in, right? Of like distinct behaviors and then passing that on to engineering to decide how that gets broken out into issues. But I think with the goal of like each issue should be something that fits into a milestone, right? Uh, easily. But I think engineering should do that grouping based on the acceptance criteria, not us. Cool. Yeah, so, so an issue of fitting into a milestone, it doesn't mean that that issue will be a deliverable. Does that make sense? Because sometimes like to achieve something, you need to do a lot of backend work for or front end or what I mean is like some yeah. prerequisite work before you can actually have a deliverable, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think it, it could be a deliverable in so far as like we can turn a feature flag on and test it somewhere and see something. I think this sort of goes to Donald's next, like we wouldn't release it though. Like if we were to split the assignees uh, like into those sort of things, we probably wouldn't release it until most all of them were done, but we could still see the progress and, and like test it. And I think that goes to like Donald's point, uh, it technically is not providing customer value if you like do it in those small little like chunks. But it, it like if you split the stories around uh, that it does like it works towards that value and it's customer facing sort of right like um, I think that most they will all provide customer value, even if we don't enable the feature flag by default yet. Yeah, as soon sense? as it provides customer value to me that's a deliverable like it, it can be behind a feature flag or not, but that's that's something that you can deliver to the guy. What I'm more talking about is like, for instance, with the work items to the, to the group level, we do have to do a lot of prerequisite work that doesn't deliver customer value right away. Like adding the, adding the column to the database, doing some backfill migration, putting in some validations to ensure that further on the data is filled in. And you still cannot use that in any way as a customer because the feature is not yet there. It's just making the prerequisite work. So that's not a deliverable per se, but we can make sure that a lot of these steps of the issues are delivered within a given milestone or aim to deliver something within the milestone and so on. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Perhaps to make it um, something more as a progress for these types of issues is maybe record a demo or present a demo of what's going on, what's the progress. Um, again, maybe not so valuable to the PM, but maybe more valuable to the uh, all of the backend engineers or front end engineers that that are within the team, so they know what's the progress of the thing and and so on. So maybe that can be. Um, one point within this acceptance criteria things when you break down things. Okay. Um, I think C, we can talk about it next time or take it async. <laughs> it's just now that we're having lots of folks from different functions that are kind of picking and maintaining their lists of things that need to be prioritized from like the issue types. Um, It'd be great if we had like sort of a process that used boards and stuff like that. So we didn't have to like talk about these, like import these giant lists into comments. Uh, once we have embeddable queries, it'll be sweet. So we can do that. But I think it would be great if we could use boards and stuff. So we can talk about that. I'm, I would love if y'all are interested to take a few minutes to let me demo a competitor product to you, uh, just because I think it's interesting. Um, or we could just talk about metrics in the last few minutes. Y'all have preference. Demo. Yeah, no. <clears throat> All right, cool. So um, today I'm going to show you Fibery. Um, I think this is sort of like a timely thing to demo because it kind of gets at the heart of some of what we're doing with work items and sort of some of these like uh, longer term flexibility things, but also shipping the same defaults. So when you onboard into Fibery, it asks you what you want to use the product for. Um, and in this case, I selected product management. So it pre-filled uh, basically my workspace with a bunch of different, you can kind of think of these as different uh, projects or whatnot, what have you. Um, one with like a product portfolio, one with strategy, customer feedback, road mapping, and, and sort of people. Um, but at the heart of these, each of these little things are all of the same <laughs> under the hood. And it's sort of where you have uh, different views that you can create. Um, you can create a table, a board, a list, a timeline, a calendar, a report, or a feed, uh, documents and, and whiteboards are different things. So you can kind of group them into folders. Um, and these are sort of just like, if you think about each of these being different views, they're just different views to slice different, uh, what I would call work items. Um, and you'll kind of, each of these work items, uh, or I, th I don't know what they call them in Fiverr, what the core thing is. Um, is driven by these like kind of customizable tables. So in the product portfolio, for example, we're looking at a, a portfolio of products and there's a product called cheering.ai. You can name it whatever you want. And it's got sort of these different widgets on it, like state description, um, objectives, insights. And this little arrow means that it's actually a relationship to something else. Uh, and so if we think about down here, we also have a strategy. This is where the OKRs live. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the objective. Uh, you can look in this data table and see that this is actually related to that objective now because uh, they they through this like kind of neat little relationship manager thing, you can specify relationships to other data tables um, uh, or to other fields or other, uh, like workspaces. So here you can say a product has a one relationship to many objectives, feature, milestone, conversation insights. And so they sort of treat all of these just different things. Um, as sort of these relationships, I can add a many to many relationship, which would sort of be like uh, linked issues or linked items right now. I can also add a many to one, which would represent sort of our current uh, epic to child relationship, uh, epic to issue relationship. Um, but from this, like I can, I can connect this one, this products table to all my other things, like whether that's objectives, insights, um, uh, customer conversations, which is another thing where down here they have customer feedback and they log each specific uh, call that they have or piece of feedback. Uh, it gets mapped to a specific product via the relationships here, where if you're gonna look at that, you can kind of see uh, how it has the relationships managed. And this is all like the same thing under the hood and it, it's used for all sorts of things from a product planning to project management to like issue tracking to uh, CRM related features because it's sort of just this like configurable data table that maps to other data tables uh, and then you can also add um, new kind of custom fields where 
these are sort of just dumb fields, um, like multi-selector, single selector, number. Um, you can also do things where you add your relationships. You can look up a show field from a related database. Um, you'd also have the ability to do formula driven fields where you kind of, as long as the, the fields that go into the formula are numeric, then you can use this. And this would be like something we could use in the future for like prioritization frameworks and models and that sort of stuff. Um, but it's really kind of interesting how you, they have the same sort of model to tie all of these different spaces together and all these different things. And it's all sort of powered by the same mechanisms under the hood and the same sort of uh, data model. Um, and so I think if, when I think about work items in the future, uh, we want to be able to support custom fields, right? And things like data tables. We want to be able to support objectives and key results and we and all these sorts of different things. And this is sort of a, a pretty good example of a product that's farther along with some of these things. Um, but it also doesn't feel like it's too overwhelming, right? Because it ships by default with all these things pre-configured for the use cases. And that's something we could do too within GitLab where you have different methodologies that you might use. Um, we can, you basically select what you want to use a workspace or a namespace for, and we kind of pre-configure that to be tailored to that kind of uh, use case, if that makes sense. So pretty cool product. Can you, can you keep it on for a second? I, yeah. I think this maps fairly well with our work items model, but it doesn't map to me, at least to my understanding, to the uh, projects model. And one thing that I'll, I'll note without knowing how it does it or what it does is, is there any way to set different permission levels on product portfolio strategy, customer feedback, because it because if not, it doesn't really map to the projects model per se, right? Yep. So this is where so, so um it, sorry, it does ahead. like it'll it feels the same as what we want to do as work items where you'll have different types. So portfolio product strategy and whatnot will fit will be a type of a work item and then you can create relationships between those which we did discussed. Um, but it doesn't, again, it, this doesn't feel to model the namespacing per se, um, in my understanding. And then the next question I would have, can we import like the, the issues from the GitLab and see how it behaves when it has at least like 50,000 issues and not just 20 or something? Um, yeah, I can do that as the next step. So what they do is sort of interesting too, how they have their, some of their, um, I think GitLab might be in here. Yeah. So they have a project a merge request, a branch, and a member, and you can, it basically is the default flow that you can import, or I think you can sync. So I'll do that and I'll invite some folks. Um, it can get really complicated too in terms of the relationships. So that's something that I think would be fun to explore a little bit. Um, in terms of like your question about permissions, I think the way that it works here is that each of these, you get added to a workspace and you can switch workspaces. So maybe like a workspace is more like a project or a namespace in GitLab. Um, but within that, you're right, these are sort of like different types and have different fields on them. Um, and then each of these gets shared uh, with, uh, basically you can define whether they're creators, editors, contributors, viewers, or no access. Um, and this is like, I guess, applicable to every single uh, row in, in the product portfolio area. And I think eventually we, we want to get to the point where we provide more granular permissions on each of these things so that you can kind of share them across like workspaces. We can figure out how we're going to do that, but there are interesting permission controls here that you can do. Um, and we can kind of look into this a little bit further, but I think once you get added to the space and let's see here, if we add people, uh, I can invite people as members, admins or guests. And so I think this is sort of the same thing as being a project member. Uh, yeah, guess. but it invites, it invites people to the entire workspace, right? It doesn't invite people only to strategy, for instance. So I want some people to only have access to the list of strategies because, so why it will not work in my opinion is because they will not have access to view the relationships that you create within uh, within the strategy. So they need to be, they need to have some permissions within the entire workspace, I would imagine. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong on that, or maybe there is some way to do that. And then the next question, as you've shown the workspaces, I wonder if they can do 
relationships between items in different workspaces or not? I don't know. I'll look into that to see if you can, because I only have one workspace set up that has anything in it. Um, I think in terms of how it works with the access and permissions, like if if I invite somebody, uh, let's say a person as, uh, if we go back to the people, I invite people, I, I make them a member, um, right? So they, it uh, looks like this can, uh, can be added to space with any role from viewer to creator. So this adds them as member, but then I can also go up here and it, like strategy, for example, if I mark this as no access, right? Um, okay. To every, everyone, to all the members, they can't see strategy and then they won't see strategy like as a relationship and things like customer feedback or a product portfolio. And it's similar to what Asana does, like if you have access to one project through the custom field, but not the other project, uh, and the issue gets shared into that other project, you can't see the custom field because you don't have access to the owner, basically, of that custom field. Um, and I think it's the same thing here, where like if I didn't have access to strategy, this column just wouldn't show up because I don't have access to it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, it will be interesting to take a look how granular that goes. It does it go for like every single role there, or does it go only for a type of these roles like product and and strategy and so on? Because like it does add a lot of overhead when you need to compute permissions as granular as every single record, every single role, right? Yeah. Um, then they go like when when you have when you need to handle. We talked about customers having millions of issues. If you need to define permission on every single issue for every single person that you have in the company, that adds up fairly to, to fairly large numbers. So it will not be as performant anymore. Yeah, we just had an issue with GitLab.com because one of our larger customers uh, unshared one of their groups with I think seven thousand people in it, and it took gitlab.com down because it had to recompute the cache permissions for that many people at once. So it's a it's a real like challenge. It's something that we should think about too and and slow roll any changes on. So yeah. Anything else that you want me to share or leave this open because I'm done demoing. Happy to walk through the um, thing though. Yeah, it looks interesting, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay, uh, also uh, I think we're at time, but I did leave uh, under anything else um, metrics highlight update for this month, just quick snapshot of where we're at. Um, growth is fine and great. Um, the estimation algorithm adds the variability to the mix, and then I listed out all the actions on work items that folks are taking from most frequent or most used to least use. Anything else that we want to talk about or cover? Super quick uh, question from somebody who's not in the like project management team. Um, we've often said that milestones at GitLab should be milestones and not a time range. So like what, when, when in your view, do you think we would be able to switch to using iteration cadences, like instead of have and have milestones as a milestone? Uh, I think you can use iteration cadences now if you want. I mean, you, in production, you can set up your own cadence for product planning and you can do your own scheduling or you could, and that's probably how, what I would recommend doing if you want to kind of have discrete things where you don't have to do a bunch of additional filtering or you could share the one with that we have going on with plan. Um, but I think that you can use them now. I think it'd be great if you did. I'm happy to work with you to figure out the best way to do that. I think Verify does that, right? Mm -hmm. Or some within within Verify uses cadences for some time now, or iterations, and then they moved to cadences as well. So I would love for us to do that, but I don't want to use both or have us have to worry about both iterations and milestones because that's where it's got. 
gotten complex in, in the past is when we are trying to fit or plan for both iterations and milestones. Yeah, if the iteration could be like the exact same length as what we now call a milestone. And then I think as well, like, uh, it's already pretty hard. I find it already pretty hard to plan each milestone just using the tools we have at the minute. So like, I think it would be good to go through and do an audit of what do we actually need to do what we do currently? And is everything there in iteration cadences? Like can we use them on boards the way we need to easily, um, all this kind of stuff. And then if so, then maybe we should consider it. I also think that if we do like a month long iterations are long, but um, whether you do a week or two weeks, if we can get in the habit of planning that way and then just assigning the milestones after the fact for everything that's going to make it into the milestone, like I would be cool with that, right? Because that's it's basically what we're doing in that way. We're not signaling a bunch of stuff ahead of time that may or may not be done already. And it's sort of like we're decoupling. And I think they're talking about this in release posts as well as like sort of decoupling the act of releasing or when the milestone due date comes from the marketing activities around what we release in a given version. Um, yeah, but think... we, still, we still have kickoffs that do kind of plan for an entire milestone though, right? I think that's that's inherently more risky because it's a longer time period and there's more unknowns yeah. in a longer time period. So that's why if, if we like, I can I can wing the like, like product stuff that you have to do for kickoffs in, in a way, but it sort of gets the point, like if I just sort of don't do anything for a release or two <clears throat> or announce anything, and then we switch to planning iterations, then the things that are like almost done or uh, I know will be done in the next iteration before the end of the milestone, that like you almost are like pulling it forward instead of saying, we haven't started this yet. We're gonna get it done at the end of the milestone. It's like picking from a pool of things that are almost done and saying, here's what we're shipping this milestone. That makes sense. So instead of planning, it's more of like uh, marketing. Yep. If you can pull into, into milestone or, or, or releases stuff from, from basically closed iterations already, that is the ideal way to do it, right? You, you already know that you are releasing that stuff. You just need to announce it basically. Yep. Um, so then there is no risk of planning and not delivering. You're just, you're just pulling in stuff. Yep. Something I'm happy to talk about and entertain. I'm, I'm down to do that if y'all are. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Cool. See ya.